welcome to any visitors uh, here this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements, um, actually quite a few announcements. Uh, next Tuesday at 11.30, we'll have Lunch Bunch. If you haven't signed up but would like to go, the sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board outside the church office. Uh, please sign up so that we can let them know how many to be expecting. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we will have our Wales trip report. I'll give a report of the trip I've just taken, show some pictures, uh, and then we'll spend a time in prayer for the churches over there. This coming Sunday... <clears throat> We have our Easter music celebration at 6 o'clock in the evening, and encourage you all to be there. Uh, some different pastors from the area will be coming and preaching for a few minutes apiece on different passages in Isaiah. Our choir will be putting on a, uh, doing music for us. Uh, it's going to be a great time, so please come to that. Um, next, uh, not this coming Thursday, but the following Thursday is our Maundy Thursday service. We're hosting that for the ARP churches in the area, and we'd encourage you all to come to that as well. Uh, directly after church, we will have a missions meeting uh, for a potential trip to Wales this summer. So if that's something you think you might be interested in, meet down front directly after service. We'll talk about that uh, just five, ten minutes, uh, and we'll, we'll do that right after church. Uh, directly after that meeting, the sound, if you are on the sound team committee, uh, you're supposed to meet with Daniel back in the library, I believe, uh, directly after that. Also a five-minute five minute meeting. Uh, and then uh, finally, Phil Bear is going to come up and give a short report of his trip uh, just a few weeks ago. We have a lot of trips going on here. We got Wales and we got a trip back from Mexico. I came back, uh, I think it's uh, almost two weeks ago. And um, I was just gonna ask you, how many languages are there in the world? 1,000, 2,000, 3,000? There are actually 7,111 languages of those, there are about 1,800, the numbers keep changing, but it's around 1,800 uh, languages yet to have uh, God's word in them. And one of those languages was uh, Lacandon in southern Mexico. But fortunately, in uh, 1979, uh, the word came to the people of Lacandon, and the, New, the Old Testament came in 1985. That was done by my parents. So we've been following up with them, and that's what I've been doing, trying to not only get God's word into their language in written form, but in oral form and in video. Um, in order to give you a flavor for people that are in such remote areas, you know God told us in Matthew 28, gave us the great commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, bring disciples, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so we go to, remotest, to the remotest areas, and this gives you a little flavor. This is the testimony of the pastor that's currently there. Uh, I solicited this testimony, and I was surprised by it myself because I didn't know all of his story. So I'm going to read it to you because I want to give you the flavor of his testimony. When I was young, my dad used to drink a lot. A neighbor of ours, a Bible-believing man who spoke a different language, remember these people live in the jungle areas, um, he came to my father and talked to him about God, but my father worshiped Lacanon idols, clay pots. He was afraid, I, I forgot my glasses, these are the, my computer glasses, so I have to read a little coarsely here. Uh, he was afraid to leave his idols because they would protect him from sickness, death, death, and famine. But the Seltal man was persistent. I overheard what the Seltal man said. This was at the time he was 13 years old, so he turned his attention to me and talked to me about believing. Come to church with me, he said, but I was afraid to go because I didn't understand Seltal very well. But the Seltal man persisted. He said Jesus came to heal people from their sins. He can heal you from yours. I knew I had many sins. 
even as a 13-year-old. So what he said sounded true to me. So I went to church with him, and I understood only a little bit of what was said, but it was enough to convince me of the truth, and I gave my inner man to God. Then I visited Phil Bear, that was my father, and he spent seven days with him. So I became certain of uh, giving my life to Jesus. I was happy. My inner man was happy. I was so happy. I talked to God all day long. My sins were forgiven. I was so happy. I didn't even sleep. I talked to God all night long. What made my, man, my inner man the happiest was that I could talk to God in my own language. Tatan. Jesus understood me. It was okay to use Tatan. I had been a disobedient young man. I didn't help my dad in the fields. I didn't help him at all. Now I wanted to help my father. I told my dad I would now help him. And I would work hard in the fields, and he was pleased. But one day, my dad asked me to feed the idols. I refused at first, but then I recanted. I knew just what to do. And he leaned forward and he said, do you know what I did? Well, I fixed the food. And then I offered a prayer to the real God. I thanked God that he had made the corn seed. I thanked him that he made the corn seed sprout. I thanked him that he made the corn grow. After the prayer, I put the idol food on the lips of the idols, and then I asked my father and mother to come. I said, look closely. Do you see the idols eating? No, they're just sitting there, aren't they? Look, they don't even move. My father was shocked. He became very, very fearful. He was fe fearful for me. I said, Father, don't fear. The idols won't make me sick. They won't kill me. I'll be fine. God will protect me. The next day, my inner man was so very happy. I wasn't sick. I showed my father that I was happy and healthy. Week after week went by, no sickness. My inner man continued to be very happy. I continued to go to Seltal Church to learn more. Whatever I learned, I taught my father. This trip to church was four hours. Finally, my father said, okay, I see that the idols are not worth anything. They're the lie of the evil one. My father asked Jesus to forgive his sins. He gave his inner man to God. When I was back at the village, I put water on the head of my father, and I built a little temple. Gives you a little flavor of the kind of people we're ministering to in the jungles of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Please make a note of any other announcements uh, in your bulletins. Uh, and with that in mind, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Please stand for the call to worship. Let us be called into worship by our God from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. 
Well, let us indeed praise him by singing together hymn number 476, The Light of the World is Jesus, hymn number 476. be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you in thanksgiving for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, as we gather together this morning to worship and to glorify you, to sing your praises, to read from your word, and to hear your word preached, we pray that you will open our hearts, that you will open our minds to understand it, that we might get a glimpse of your glorious majesty as you sit upon the throne. O oh, Father, you are indeed good. You are worthy of all praise. You are majestic and wonderful. O oh, God, you do not change. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You, O oh Lord, are eternal. And yet, you have made yourself known to us through Jesus Christ, your Son, and through your Word. O oh God, we are undeserving of that. Father, we continually, day after day, disobey you, rebel against you, turn from you, and spit in the face of Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we do the things that we should not do. The things that you have commanded us to do, we don't do those either. O oh God, as we come before you this morning, as we come before your throne, we pray that you will forgive us. 
We trust in the majestic name of Jesus Christ as our mediator and as our sacrifice. We trust that he will make intercession for us and on our behalf. O Lord, that when you look at us, you will see only Christ, only his wondrous deeds, only his perfect obedience, his righteousness, and his holiness. That when you look at us, you will not see the dirty, sinful men and women that we are, but that you will see only Christ. O Lord, we are so very thankful for that. We are so very thankful that we have mercy and we have grace in Christ Jesus. And especially as we approach Easter in the coming weeks, we are so very thankful for his sacrifice. Oh God, thank you that you are indeed a good God, that you are wonderful and mighty, worthy of all praise. Oh Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray in the same manner that he taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and respond. giver of all good gifts and giver of life. We thank you uh, for the gifts that you have given us in Jesus Christ, and we thank you for him most of all. Father, as we give of these tithes and these offerings this morning, we pray that you will give us the spirit of the widow, who, though she had only a little, gave all that she had. And, O oh Lord, as we give, we pray that you will bless it, and that you will multiply it as you did the loaves and the fishes, that you will use it for the expansion of your kingdom around the world, that your congregation may grow and that your name may be glorified. We pray all this in the precious and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, our confession of faith this morning comes from the Apostles' Creed, and you'll find this on the inside of your bulletin. What we want to think about and highlight today is that Christ indeed has risen from the grave, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And as we come before the throne room of God, Christ will be there reigning and ruling over us, making intercession for us, and what a wonderful truth that is. So with that in mind, Christian, I ask you, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, if you'll take your blue ARP Psalters, we're going to sing together number 69D, the name of God, number 69D. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. If you're using the Pew Bibles, you'll find this on page 241. 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 5. Let us hear the word of the Lord. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Thus ends the reading of God's holy and errant and life-giving word. Let us pray together. Our God and our Father, Lord of heaven and earth, O God, we come before you as your people, as your sons and your daughters, in right standing before you because of what Christ has done. O Lord, we come before you this morning with the needs of our church, with the needs of our community, with the needs of our country, and with the needs of our world. Oh God, as we gather together and we have the opportunity to pray together, we remember what you have said, that if we ask, it will be answered, O Lord, and that our prayers will not go unheard. We have these promises that you have given to us, and so as we pray this morning, we remember those promises. Father, we want to pray for the members of this church, O Lord, for those who are sick, with stomach bugs, with 
uh, other sicknesses, pneumonia, um, the flu. Lord, we want to pray for those who are struggling with other health things, with um, heart issues, with breathing issues. Oh, Lord, those who are shut in and unable to get to church on Sunday because they don't have the strength, they don't have the ability. Lord, we want to lift them up to you. We pray that you will encourage them and that you will strengthen them. For those that are sick, that you will heal them quickly, that they might return to us. O oh Lord, for those who have more permanent illnesses, that you will give them peace and comfort that only you can provide. That you will remind them that Christ is indeed Lord, sitting on the throne, and that you are the great physician, and that you have called them for such a time as this. O oh Lord, we thank you that we can pray these things knowing that you are willing to answer. O oh Lord, we want to pray for the Henleys this morning especially, as they are struggling uh, in, in all that they have to take care of and caring for both parents, both sets of grandparents. Lord, we want to pray that you will strengthen them uh, and that you will bring them comfort and peace as they rest, that you will uh, allow them to do all that is necessary for them to do. Oh God, we want to pray not only for the members of this church, but for our missionaries abroad. We want to pray for Rebecca Carson in Germany as she works there and labors there for your word, for your sake. I'm going to pray for Mark Witte and his family in Spain as they also labor for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that you will be with them, that you will give them strength and comfort, that even as they are thousands of miles from their family, that they will be at home with their true heavenly family that they will be able to minister effectively, that they will share the gospel, that many will hear and be saved, that your church might grow, that your people might increase, that your name might be glorified. Oh Lord, we want to pray for our local mission trip, Appalachia, coming up this summer. We pray that you will, even now, prepare those who you want to go on that trip, that you will prepare our hearts and our minds, that as we go and as we share the gospel with these children, as we minister to this church in the mountains, that you will allow us to be a blessing and not a hindrance, that you will allow us to share your gospel and not our own words, that it will be for your glory and not for our own glory. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you that you are able to answer these prayer requests. Oh God, we pray not only for our mission teams that are going abroad, or missionaries that are abroad and our mission team going to Appalachia, but, oh Lord, we pray for our influence on this community, especially as we approach Easter, as more people come to church uh, than any other time of year. We pray that you will give us the courage to reach out, to share the gospel with those who don't believe, with those who don't go to church, that we will encourage them and invite them to church, that we will be a shining light on a hill, not just a building that looks nice as you drive down Main Street, but, oh Lord, that you will allow each and every person in here to go and to share the gospel for your sake. That it will be on our lips every moment of every day. That no one will be able to talk to us for even a few moments without knowing that we are a Christian who serves you, the living God. Oh Lord, we pray that as we seek to obey you, as we seek to share your gospel and to invite people to church, that you will bless those efforts. That you will bring people to church, that you will use us to share the gospel with the lost and with the hurting here in Lancaster. That you will use us to serve you and to glorify your name, that your congregation might grow. O oh Lord, we pray for our country, for our leaders, both at the state and local levels as well as on the national level. O oh God, as many of them are people who do not serve you, who mock Christians, who care nothing for life or for your word, we pray that you will change their hearts. We pray that you will use your spirit to work in them, that they might see the horrific sin in which they are participating, and that they might see the beautiful gospel that Christ has brought and offered to them. Oh God, we pray for those leaders who are Christians as they come under scrutiny more and more. We pray that you will give them strength to stand firm against evil, to do what is right, to seek to lead this country in the way of Christ. We pray that you will be with them, that you will guide them. Oh Lord, we pray also for our president. And whether or not we like him or don't like him, whether or not we like the things he does or don't do, 
You, O God, have appointed him as president of the United States, as a leader. And, O Lord, you have told us in your word in Romans that we are to respect and to honor him because you are the one that put him there. And so, O God, we pray for him. We pray that you will turn his heart to Christ, but that you will give him wisdom as he leads this country, that you will allow him to serve you, to do what you would have him to do, and that he would lead our country in a direction that is good and that is gospel-oriented rather than down a path of evil. Oh God, finally we want to pray for Kyle and for the Sims family as they're traveling, as he's preaching this Sunday. Um, We want to pray that you will give him the words to speak, that he might be an encouragement to the Reformed Presbyterian congregations in which he's speaking. But oh Lord, we pray that you will protect them on their trip, that they will have an enjoyable vacation, especially tomorrow and in the days to come as they go into Chicago and to to just celebrate some time as a family uh, and to rest. We pray that you will give them that rest, that it will be an eventful trip in a good way and that they will have safe travel and safe return home uh, later this week. God, we thank you that you are indeed the Lord who sits upon the throne, that you are sovereign and good and that you are able to do more than all that we can ask and even more than we can begin to imagine. We thank you for it all, and we pray for it all. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. If the children will come forward for the children's sermon. How are y'all this morning? Good? Have any of y'all ever planted a garden? You have? Okay. Yeah? Have you, you've seen gardens too, right? You've seen, have you even seen like the big farms and big fields and stuff? All right, so what are some of the steps to planting a garden? Do, if you just decide you want a garden, does it grow? No? What, what do you have to do? Yep, you have to get seeds. Mm-hmm. Yep, you gotta water it. Yep. Yeah, the more water you give it, the more it grows. Yeah, that's exactly right. You have to start with the little seed and you you put it in the ground and you water it and then it sprouts and you keep watering it and you even weed it some and, and take good care of it and then it grows big and tall. And whether that's a flower or another type of plant, you have to care for it like that. Well. Did you know that Jesus uses the example of a garden or a field for us as Christians? He says that we are seeds and that we are going to grow more and more as we are watered by the word of God. But then he also tells us that we get to go and plant seeds. We get to go and spread the word of God, spread the gospel, and that those are the seeds of salvation. And as we spread those seeds, we want to take care of them. We want to check up on the people that we share the gospel with. We want to encourage them. And then once they begin to sprout, we want to to share more with them. We want to tell them more about God and about the Bible. And with that, that they'll continue to grow more and more until Jesus has a whole harvest that he'll bring in one day. Well, that's our mission as Christians. That's what we want to focus on. We want to plant those seeds, and we want to water those seeds so that Christ one day will get to harvest those seeds. And that's, that's something even y'all can do. Did you know that? You, when you're at school, you can tell people about Jesus. You can invite your friends to church. You can tell them all the things that you're hearing about and you're learning about, all the Bible stories. That's something y'all can do right now. And that's something that all of us can do as well. All right, well, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that you have given us the ability to share the gospel, to plant those seeds and to water them. Oh, Lord, that you would use us as your tools. Uh, We cannot even begin to imagine, and we are so very thankful for. And we pray that uh, from the smallest to the greatest of us, we pray that you will help us to share those seeds more and more each day, that we will tell people about the wondrous news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you do for us, and we pray all this in his name. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, you can open to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1009. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Let's hear the word of God. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Well, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. O Lord, who sits upon the throne, as we approach your word this morning, we pray that you will give us ears to hear, that you will open our hearts, melt our hearts of stone, that we might understand and consume your word. And O Lord, as we hear from it this morning, we pray that we will leave changed, that we will leave here praising and glorifying you for your wondrous works of salvation and for all that you have done. O Lord, speak through me, not my words, but yours, not for my glory or for our sake, but for your glory alone. We pray all this in the precious, holy, and majestic name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, C.S. Lewis, in the final book of his epic fantasy, epic allegorical fantasy, The Chronicles of Narnia, describes this moment when the heroes, Jill, Eustace, Tyrion, and Jewel, enter into his version of paradise. There, in the midst of the most beautiful landscape, they stand, along with a number of dwarves who did not believe in Aslan. However, what Jill and the rest see is quite different from what the dwarves see. Rather than a beautiful landscape full of flowers and trees and waterfalls, the dwarves see only darkness, smell only rottenness, and feel only dirt. Their perspective was that the old world, the world that they had come from, was much better that it was much brighter and greener. They thought that they were being tricked and that Jill and the others were simply going mad. What those dwarves thought is very similar to the way you and I think. We often look at things and assign them value based upon their appearance. If you see a well-dressed man in a suit and tie, you you assume he's an important businessman. If you see a young boy running around in tattered clothes, you assume that his parents are poor, don't care about him or both. If you see a beautiful church building with an incredible pipe organ and full pews, you assume they're doing something right. It's the way you and I are wired, but as we're going to see in our passage this morning, our worship is not that way. Our worship is not that way. In fact, our worship is the exact opposite. And as we look this morning, it'll be helpful for us to understand a little bit of the background of the book of Hebrews in order to understand this passage. So the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who had converted out of Judaism in the early church. They had left the old religion and they had come to Christ. They no longer worshipped in the temple, they worshipped in the homes of the believers. And rather than being in their comfortable environment where their entire nation gathered to worship at the same temple, rather than worshiping in this glorious temple with with gold and with silver all overlaid, with these beautiful tapestries, this outer court that was full of people praising and singing to Christ or to God, uh, with an inner court that had these beautiful bronze basins and this beautiful altar. They didn't have the smells of the incense. They didn't have the, the bleeding of the sheep and the, the beautiful aroma of the sacrifice. They didn't have the priests in their wonderful garments. They no longer had this, this old religion, this beautiful thing that they had had before. And though it was only Herod's temple rather than Solomon's temple, it was still a wonderful sight to behold as all of Israel would gather and worship God. They had left this. And rather than 
staying a Jew. They were cast out. They were, they were shunned by their friends and their families. And each morning as they awoke, they were unsure whether that day they would lose their jobs, their livelihood, their families, or even their lives. They had left the Jewish religion. They had gone to Christ to persecution. There was no temple. They worshiped in small homes. There was no gold. There was no sacrifices, no incense, no, no wonderful meeting place, and there were very few in number. No longer was a nation gathering to worship, but a handful of believing Christians. And so the book of Hebrews was written for the purpose of encouraging them in their faith, for reminding them that Christ was indeed better than the old religion, that despite what it looked like on the outside, it was a much more glorious and much more wonderful thing. And we even see this in the very first section, uh, first verses of Hebrews, where the writer says, long ago in many times and in many ways, God spoke by the prophets, but now he has given us his son. And in the first chapter, he goes on to talk about how Christ is better than the angels, how he has a better name than the most glorious angels. And here in chapter 12, he turns to worship, turns to their meeting as they gather as believers, and he says, this is better than what you had before. This is more wonderful and more glorious than what you had before. And the way that he does this is he, he goes and he begins to compare what the old covenant worship looked like with what the new covenant worship looked like. What Israel used to do versus what the church now does. He's looking at worship before Christ had come and after Christ had come. And as we look at this this morning, there's something we don't want to be mistaken about. Ultimately, all the worship from the Old Testament to the New was about Christ. Christ was promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Christ was promised to Abraham in Genesis 15 and 17. He was promised to Noah and to Moses and to David. The prophecies looked forward to Christ. All of the Old Testament was ultimately pointing towards Christ. It was all about Christ. But at the same time, it was a mere shadow of the things that were to come. It was mere shadows and, and promises that would, were yet to be fulfilled. And then Christ comes, and we have the New Testament. We have seen Christ. We have recorded about his life. We know what he has done. The promises are clear and fulfilled now. And this is what the author of Hebrews is attempting to convey. So first he looks at the Old Covenant worship at Mount Sinai, and you see this in verses 18 through 21. He says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. He describes the Old Covenant worship, the Old Testament worship as Israel in the wilderness gathered at Mount Sinai, as God descended on the mountain in burning fire, in great darkness, in the midst of storms and of shadows and of clouds, a powerful and wondrous display, but a display so great and so terrible that all of Israel trembled. He describes it as the sound of a trumpet coming out, the the idea that the king has come down. He is coming before the people of Israel. And when God spoke, his voice was so great and so terrible and so wondrous that Israel begged that he not speak again because they could not stand the sound of his voice. It was a glorious and wonderful display of God's power and of his holiness and of his goodness. The command was that no one was to approach the mountain. No one was to approach God lest they die. In this old covenant worship, yes, God was there. They could see the cloud. They could hear his voice. They could see the fire and the darkness, and they heard the trumpet, but they were afraid. They could not approach God. They could not come to the mountain where he was. There. Worship was in fear and trembling. Even Moses, the only man to ever see the back of God, was afraid. He trembled with fear. And so, yes, while in the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, 
Israel knew God. Yes, they had these sights and these sounds. And even in the temple, their worship was informed by visual things. They were to wash before they entered into the inner temple. There, they then sacrificed before they could go and make a further plea. And in the innermost part was the holies, uh, holy of holies where God dwelt. Each step in their worship was a picture of what would ultimately come. There had to be washing, there had to be sacrifice, and then you could get to God. Yes, the Old Testament was filled with visual pictures, with, with promises that were coming. They saw God, but they could not approach him because they were afraid, and because if they did, they would die. And this teaches us something about ourselves, that we have no ability to approach God on our own. We cannot approach the glorious King of heaven because he is holy and we are not. We cannot approach unless we have Christ. And so the author of Hebrews is describing this old worship, this idea that that God was there, that they could see God. They even saw him in the wilderness leading them as a fire, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. In Solomon's temple, when it was finished and Solomon utters his great prayer, God fills the temple in smoke. They had the visual, but they had no hope of approaching it. They were set in their sin. They were set repeatedly offering sacrifices after sacrifices, sacrifices that could never fully atone, that could never fully fix the problem. And this is the Old Testament. This is the old temple. This is the old religion that the author of Hebrews is describing. But then he contrasts it with the new covenant, with the new promise. The promise made flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John says in his first chapter of his gospel. And we see this in verses 22 through 24. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. He kind of sets aside three things that contrast with what was before with the old covenant he says first of all where they have come to no longer are they in the wilderness at mount sinai but they have come to the better mountain to the mountain of zion where god dwells to the city where god dwells to the better jerusalem it is a better mountain it is a better city it is a better place they have been gathered into the city of god where they will worship him no longer is it Doom and gloom, great darkness and storms and fire and lightning, but many angels, innumerable angels, in bright and beautiful robes, praising God for who he is and for what he has done in Christ Jesus. They have come to a better place, a better atmosphere. The Christian worship, while not physical, is spiritual. And in that spirituality, we gather together as believers and we are brought up into the throne room of Almighty God. And there we are gathered with all believers and we praise him and honor him for who he is. But we are brought to the new mountain, to the new Jerusalem. But it's not only we are brought to a better place, but it's who is brought. Notice what he says in verse 23. He says, And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now, there's something we need to notice here. He's put two broad categories here that tell us something. First, the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. That is all Christians, all believers, all who have been given the rights of the firstborn in Jesus Christ. All who are enrolled in heaven have their names in the book of life. But secondly, to those who are dead, the spirits of the righteous that have been made perfect. He's saying that as you gather together as Christians, it's not only you gathering in this church building. It's not only us gathered here at First Lancaster. When we gather on Sunday morning, that is not all that is worshiping God, but all believers all around the world are drawn up into the throne room of God. All who have claimed the name of Christ, all who have 
honored him as Lord, who have been saved by him, are drawn up together into the throne room of God. And as we sing our praises, we are singing together with those who are singing in China and in Europe and in South America. We are gathered together as one congregation, as one people. Yes, we sit here physically, but spiritually we are drawn into the heavenly places, into the throne room of God, and that is where we worship. We are not gathered with 80, 90 people here. We are gathered with innumerable thousands of people dead and alive who have been gathered spiritually to the throne room of God, and there we worship and we honor him. It is all those who are alive and all those who are dead. We worship God together as one body in Christ. Jesus. And this tells us something about the church. Yes, we have individual churches. We have First ARP Lancaster. We have Unity. We have Shiloh. We have churches scattered around Eastern America. We have churches, uh, gospel-believing churches all around the United States, all around Europe, all on every continent in the world. We have churches. And those are important. Those are, have individual people that have individual lives that matter, but ultimately we are one church. This is the idea of the physical church or the visible church versus the invisible church. Yes, we are a visible church. We have a physical building. We gather together physically, but there is also the invisible church that consists of all believers in all times, everywhere. And when we gather to worship, when we gather to pray, we pray for them. We worship with them. We worship the same God. We are one body in Christ Jesus. We are one bride of Christ. We are gathered together in unity. And this affects the way that we think about our worship. This affects the way that we think about what we pray about, what we do with our money and with our time. We are one body united in Christ Jesus. When we support missionaries In Germany and in Spain, we are supporting brothers and sisters that are a part of our congregation. It's as though we are helping those who are too uh, struggling financially or spiritually in our own congregation when we support them with our money and with our prayer. We are united together in Jesus Christ. And even as we support those and we send mission trips, we we are sending missionaries to help other believers, to help the body of Jesus Christ. It's not that we are separate from them, that we are thousands of miles away and and are different from them, but we are one body in Christ Jesus, gathered together before the throne, worshiping and praising God. But the third thing that is better is the gospel. The third thing he notes is the difference. On the old mountain, they could not approach. They could not hear the voice of God, they could not touch the mountain lest they died. But now we have a great mediator, a great high priest who makes intercession for us before the throne of God. Look at verse uh, 23 and 24. First, he talks about how God is the judge of all. God has not changed from the Old Testament. God is still the judge that sits on the throne But then there are the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect. And how have they made perfect? Look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The gospel is here presented. The gospel is what has made the difference from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The gospel is what affects the way that we worship God is still judge. God does not change. He has not changed from the beginning of time until now. But Christ has come. He is the mediator of the new covenant. His blood has been spilled for our sake. It has been sprinkled upon us that we are clean. It is better than the blood of Abel. And even there you see he's looking back to the Old Testament that was pointing to Jesus Christ. Christ now stands between God and man. When God looks at us, he sees Christ Jesus. He sees Christ in his holiness and in his goodness and in his perfection. And through Christ sees us. And so sees us as holy and righteous and perfect. Christ is the mediator sitting on the throne, standing between God and between man. Interestingly enough here, when he talks about the sprinkled blood, that's 
why we sprinkle when we do baptisms. It's a symbolism of the blood being sprinkled on the head and cleansing and washing. In the Old Testament, the priests would take the blood of the sacrifice and they would dip a branch, a hyssop branch in it, and they would sprinkle the blood over the head of the person who brought the sacrifice, symbolizing their cleansing. Well, Christ has come and he has spilt the final blood that needs to be spilt. And so in baptism, we sprinkle to symbolize the blood of Christ covering you, washing you, and making you pure. God is still on the throne. He still cannot allow sin to go unpunished. He is still a fearsome and holy God. But yet we as Christians have the ability to gather together and approach him. We can come into the throne room worshiping and praising with the glorious angels in their, their great robes and in their loud music and their trumpets and their sounds and all the saints of all time and all over the world gathering together and worshiping and praising God. And we do not have to say, please do not speak for I'm afraid, because we have a great mediator, a great high priest who has made intercession for us before God Almighty. And so we have hope. Well, this is all very well and good. Yes, I think you and I can agree that the gospel is much better than the Old Testament, better than the shadows are the promises that have been fulfilled and recorded. But why does this affect, or how does this affect you and I? Three applications I think we can take from this, and there's definitely many more, but three primarily. First of all, do not neglect the gathering of believers. In Hebrews 10, 25, he says, Let us not neglect meeting together, as some have the habit of doing. Rather, let us encourage each other all the more as you see the day approaching. We should not neglect the weekly gathering of the believers. Why? Because as we gather together, we are caught up into the throne room of God, and we worship not only with those around us, but with all believers in all of the world. I found it interesting as I was on my trip to Wales, being four hours ahead at the time. Normally it's five. Uh, it was four because their daylight savings time is later. Uh, it was a little confusing. But I found it interesting that as we gathered for worship, uh, it was early morning for y'all, and by the time we kind of finished worship, y'all were getting here for Sunday school. You would have been getting here, getting ready for church. And as y'all did Sunday school and did church, about the time everybody was leaving, we were preparing to go back to evening service. And I thought about it, and as if you look at all the different time zones across the world, there is rarely an hour on Sunday when a believer is not gathered together somewhere in the world worshiping. God. And I, th I thought that was an interesting thought. But the fact is, is when we decide we have more important things to do than to gather together on Sunday, when we decide that we have more uh, important things or we don't have the energy to gather together to worship God, we are giving up on an opportunity to encourage other believers. We are giving up on an opportunity to approach the throne room of God and to praise and to worship him. We're saying whatever it is that's keeping us from church is more important than worshiping God. It's more important than Jesus Christ. And so as the author of Hebrews says, do not neglect the gathering together of believers. Secondly, remember the body of Christ of which you are a member. You are a member of a great and glorious body that is not bound by these walls or these doors. You are a member of the heavenly body of Christ, the the body that is built up of believers all around the world throughout all time. You are a, an heir and a brother and a sister to all the great saints, to David and to Moses, to the great heroes of our faith. You are a brother and sister. You are a part of that same body. You are important. All of us minister to one another and to the body of Christ through our prayers, through talking to one another, through uh, gathering together and worshiping, you are a minister to the body of Christ. Do not forget that. But thirdly, be encouraged. Be encouraged despite what happens in your day-to-day -day life. We have hard things happen in our lives. We get busy with our jobs, with our work, or with our school, uh, with, with everything that has to be done, with taking care of parents and grandparents, with uh, of doing this and that and of all the programs we get tired and then something else happens our car breaks down our uh, 
parent has to be put in the hospital, whatever it may be, our, things happen in our day-to-day -day lives that are discouraging and that are hard. But no matter what happens, when Sunday comes around, we are gathered together as one body and we are brought up into the throne room of God where we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb who forever intercedes for us. We have a heavenly fellowship, a perfect fellowship. We will one day be made perfect, made so by Christ Jesus himself. No matter what happens, we have a hope in our day-to-day -day lives. But not only be encouraged in your day-to-day -day life, be encouraged in our church. It doesn't matter how small this body of believers is. It doesn't matter if we get down to 30 or 20 or 10 people coming to church on Sunday morning. Yes, we want to grow. We want more people. We would be happy if there was standing room only every Sunday. But we don't want that growth. We don't want those people to come so that our church looks full and people look at our church and say, oh, what a great church. We want that growth so that the great congregation of Christ may grow, that more voices may be gathered together singing his praises each and every day. And when we gather together, no matter how few of us there are, we are bound together by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are a part of a great, great heavenly congregation. And that is what matters. Christ is our goal. Christ is our purpose in our life, and Christ is the purpose of our worship. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, sitting on the throne of heaven into which we have come, O oh Lord, we are so very thankful that we are able to stand before your throne, justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. O oh God, we do not have to fear that if we approach you, we will die, because Christ has died for us. He took our place. He bore your wrath for our sake, that we might approach you, that we might worship you. And, O oh Lord, as we gather together here in Lancaster, O oh Lord, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters all around the world, that as we all gather as one heavenly congregation, as we are all one body in Christ, we pray that they will be encouraged in their worship, that they will be encouraged as they gather together this evening. We thank you for all that you do for us. And we pray all of this in the precious, holy, and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you will take your Red Trinity hymnals, we're going to sing together hymn number 164, all the verses. There are six verses. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, hymn number 164, standing as we sing. Well, if you are not a part of that great heavenly body, 
you are invited by Jesus Christ to come to repent of your sins, to trust in him, and to call him Lord. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that you will bless us and keep us, that you will make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. Pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.